Without further ado, um, I would like to introduce Nancy Kirkpatrick, our WolfCon keynote speaker today. She is the executive, executive director and CEO of OhioNet. Oh, I put on my reading voice. Um, a multi-tight library consortium representing a diverse membership throughout Ohio and the region. She practiced nonprofit law and advocacy before entering the library space, where she has over a decade of experience. An ALA Spectrum Scholar, she holds an MS in Library and Information Science from the I School, Cormie Gisless at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and a JD from the T.C. Williams School of Law at the Rich University of Richmond, and a BA in Journalism from Drake University. She is a Human Certified Design Practitioner and is currently completing facilitator qualifications in appreciative inquiry and conversations worth having. She's interested in applying these concepts to work in libraries and related industries. I, she also enjoys writing, and you can find her most recent work in a series of short pieces on the Ohio Net blog called Director's Desk. So thank you, Nancy. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Okay, excellent. And I'm going to give him a second to pull up my slides, maybe. Well, in the meantime, since the first slide is nothing important at all, um, I just want to say what an honor it is to be with you here today. Um, if you've never heard me talk or have never read anything I've written, I should probably warn you that I might ask more questions than I answer today. Um, I often find myself in rooms like this full of very smart and innovative people. And frankly, I'm curious about this, your experiences and your solutions to some of the challenges that we face in our field and in our world. So here's my plan. Uh, today, and this is just per what I uh, sent in advance for the SCED, for the SCED uh, app, my plan is to talk about why we should be open and inclusive in our language, actions, and systems. And the answer to that, frankly, is not complicated. We should be open and inclusive in our language, actions, and systems because it is the right thing to do. It is equitable, fair, just. Every human deserves to be treated with respect, to feel as if they belong, and to know that the system takes them into consideration. And until that reality, or until that is reality rather than aspiration, we have some work to do. So thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> what do you wanna do for the next hour? No, I'm kidding. Um, so all jokes aside, I do hope to provide you with some practical tips and resources as you endeavor to do this work. And of course, we've saved some room at the end for any questions or comments. And again, hopefully I can learn a little bit about what you're doing. So uh, next thing is just some housekeeping. I'm gonna post my presentation to the SCED app as soon as I figure out how to do that when we're done. So you can access all of the links. There are many. Um, so no worries about trying to photograph and then like zoom in on the little tiny print at the bottom. I've checked all the hyperlinks, they all work. You're good to go. Um, the second little bit of housekeeping for me is I'm going to use the word libraries often today because ultimately those are the communities that we serve. But note that even though I'm saying libraries, that word in almost every instance could be inter uh, interchanged with individuals or systems. Sometimes I'll call out a different group and a exa particular example, but when I say libraries, I'm doing that just because it's more efficient than saying libraries, organizations, people, systems every time I mention them. So. Um, yeah, all right. So as we opened the conference on Wednesday, there were some really great shot, uh, thoughts shared during that first plenary. Tom reminded us that as we strive for an open ecosystem, which I think is a, a great analogy to their systems, that that is an, an important part of our work. Um, biodiversity in an ecosystem is important for the health of all its inhabitants. And I think the same is true for our library systems. Diversity not only in thought and experience, but also quite literally in race, gender, background, ability, and the like helps ensure that we create systems that serve all the diverse members of our communities. So I want you to do me a favor. Take a few seconds if you're in the room, and sorry to the people who are online that can't do this. Look around and look at the faces of your colleagues and tell me what you see as you look around this room and maybe what you don't see. So for, for those of you joining us via Zoom, is that a thing? Are we still really? Oh, God bless you for being up this early if you're in the North American time zone. So we have, I'm gonna say 100, 
150, maybe 160 people sitting in this room. Um, it's a lovely auditorium. Uh, looking around this crowd, it is predominantly lacking melanin. Um, there's a pretty even split along gender lines, it looks like. I'm not going to guess at ages, but I would just say broadly, people in this room are anywhere between 20s and 60s, and probably the mass are kind of in the middle. Um, yeah. So we might be a geographically diverse group, to be sure, but we might be lacking some diversity in other areas, and I think that's something we should talk about. So I would say, uh, likewise, our job titles may vary, but the true richness of our world and the communities we serve is not necessarily reflected in this room. And that's not unusual. That's, this is not a WolfCon thing. This is kind of a larger societal issue, at least in North America, that we are dealing with and, and finally trying to um, attempt to solve in a variety of ways. And that energy towards being more inclusive is something that I find really encouraging. So uh, moving on, Sebastian noted uh, during that first panel that one of the strengths of this community is that it creates a space where functional experts can come and play together and where library leaders can come and strategize together. And my hope is that as we strategize and play, we're being deliberate about making sure that our teams are diverse and everybody gets to play. That we ask ourselves not only what is the game and what are the rules, but which players are absent and how do we create a safe and welcoming space to invite them to the game in the first place? Also during that opening panel, Paula reminded us that the whole philosophy of Folio is to let everything in the past go and start fresh. So without delving too much into history, let's just agree that as we start fresh, we give ourselves permission to build these new open systems in ways that are truly inclusive. And we have an opportunity oh, to do that in real time. To me. Uh, maybe. There we go. So in the U.S., for example, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy recently Hello. expanded a 2013 policy yeah, and is now requiring that by 2025, all peer-reviewed research that is federally funded be open access at the time of publication, removing the 12-month embargo of the prior policy and expanding the applicable agencies. So this is, to my mind, a great step in the right direction. And some librarians, unsurprisingly, are very happy about this. Uh, indeed, it is, uh, it, it is encouraging to see that they want to share scholarship in a way that we haven't done before. However, this action in and of itself does nothing to address the inequities which already exist in scholarly publishing itself. And that has not gone unnoticed by some scholars. Um, including Dr. K. Matthew Dames on the left, who is the inaugural Edward H. Arnold Dean of Hesburgh Libraries and the University Press at Notre Dame, and also the 61st president of the uh, Association of Research Libraries, ARL, and Alexis Smith Macklin, director of the Library and Center for Digital Learning at Carlo University. And there, I'm not going to read all of their comments, but basically their response to this news and the article was. Um, Alexis particularly says, Sarah, why not ask a librarian at a small or mid-sized university about the impact of the new federal mandate for open access? This move will create equity issues, but no one seems to care. Um, Dr. Um, Dames says that his biggest concern is that the open access announcement is, uh, is that neither the academy nor librarianship are strategically ready for this move. There is much more to his comment, so I would link that for you, but it, they both bring up some very valid points that this is great and the systems are all still a little broken and we maybe need to address that at the same time. Um, and in fact, one could question whether higher ed in the United States at least is in fact equitable. And Matthew Rice does just that in his Times Higher Ed piece. Um, which is an interview with the authors of Can College Level the Playing Field, Higher Ed in an Unequal Society from Princeton University Press. That book in particular addresses the inequities, but it also prevents or presents some possible solutions. So that might be a resource we're checking out. And while libraries today may be moving towards more equitable systems, equitable representation and equitable scholarship, we have to be intentional about that work. So before I go any further, I'm going to take a drink because, wow, I haven't talked this much in a really long time. I should confess that I don't have the answers. Sorry. I mean, not sorry, but, and my suggestions are just that. They're my suggestions. 
They're based on reading and research and my personal experience as a racially ambiguous, biracial, Black identifying woman traversing this planet and coexisting in many spaces. So your experience may vary. But I thought that was worth mentioning because when we come, whether we're coming to WolfCon or a presentation or just coming to work, I think it's important to recognize and bring your entire self. So that's just a little bit about who I am. And as I thought about this presentation over the past month or so, my goal was really to give you something easy to remember so that as you moved forward in your work, you could uh, refer back to it, perhaps. Um, and I thought, of course, because I'm a librarian, that a good acronym might be accessible. So this is the uh, acronym that I landed on. Surprise, open. I mean, could there have been any other, right? This is WolfCon, let's be serious. Um, it had to be open because this is what we do. This is, we are all about, you know, the conference organizer is the Open Library Foundation. We are open about the work we engage in. And so for our purposes, open means observe, prepare, embark, and nap. <laughs> yeah. Now, before you stop listening, because the last word is nap, that is not a mistake. By the end of the talk, you'll understand. And I will hope to demonstrate why rest is important. So uh, I've been fortunate of late to spend a lot of time learning, uh, immersed in theories, including human-centered design, which Beth mentioned, and appreciative inquiry. And for some of you, these are probably not new ideas, um, but they might be. So let me just tell you what those things are. So design thinking, and this uh, definition comes from Tim Brown, who's the executive chair of IDEO, which is a design thinking firm, is a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of the people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. I think you could easily take out the word business and substitute library success, system success, organizational success. But the point is, this is a human-centered approach. So we are not concerned with widgets. We're concerned with how do the people use the widgets and how do those widgets make their lives better, right? And then appreciative inquiry. Um, is this is this approach that has like a five, it's called the 5D process. There were four Ds, then somewhere along the way, somebody said, no, there's a fifth D. There are arguments about whether there are four or five. I like the five. But the process is basically, uh, first, define your desired outcome. Second is discover and figure out what your strengths are. Third, dream what, what would work in the future. Fourth is finally the design process. What actions can we take to make it happen? And then five is deploy, where you actually take action. And this process is very iterative because it really, if you're doing it right, you never end. You get to five, you deploy something, you do something for a while, and then you go back to the beginning and you start again. And what I really appreciate about both AI and human-centered design is the intentionality that is centered on the human. We are not designing systems in a vacuum, right? At the end of the day, we do what we do so that the human experience or interaction has meaning. So before I get to, uh, into what open really means to me and kind of my point with the acronym, I have one more caveat that I think is worth sharing. As we work together, and I mean the, like the collective we being you know human beings, and as we endeavor to tackle subjects that are sometimes uncomfortable, I want to encourage you to do two things. First, be as authentic as you can. This means different things to everyone, and frankly, it means different things to the same person at different points in time. Uh, for example, as a Black woman who grew up in America, I was counseled by my mentors to look a certain way, act a certain way, or be a certain way at work when I first started my career. Um, if you've ever heard of code switching, you might have an idea of what I'm talking about. And if you not, if you haven't heard of code switching, you can do a little Google search later. But basically, I showed up at every job interview with straight hair and the right suit and the right makeup and the right, because I thought I had to play a certain role to be accepted at work. And while I'm not saying I have completely re rehabilitated myself from those lessons because they were coming from a place of protection, I've realized, especially in the last four or five years, that I have to be willing to share of myself at work in order to do this work in a more authentic way and to get it accomplished. And that's not always easy, right? Being authentic does not mean you have to share private details of your life if you don't want to. 
And so and this, this is really for the bosses in the room, allow people to have a private life, okay? Um, because frankly, the impact of sharing private information at work has historically had different consequences for historically excluded people. And that can be people of color, um, our friends in the LGBTQIA communities, women, you know, if I have a doctor appointment, that's one thing. And it's different than if my boss who is a male has a doctor appointment. Shouldn't be that way, but at least in America where I won't talk about our healthcare system, we have some issues there. So let people share at whatever level they're comfortable and don't press, but try to create a culture that enables or allows people to be authentic. And I think as you start to do that, you will see when people aren't afraid of the negative consequences of being themselves at work, they're going to be more willing to share and they're going to help further your work into inclusion. And my second thing is to, is to say that recognize that your colleagues are likely being as authentic as they can and that their individual circumstances may afford them more or less ability to do so based on their lived experiences. I refer you back to item number one. So as we consider how our systems might truly embrace equity and inclusion to create belonging, the first step is to observe. Before we go on any journey, I think it helps to get a lay of the land and see what's happening around us. Literally stop moving, which seems very hard for libraries and librarians sometimes because we have to go, go, go when there's 112 things to do and we've always done it this way. Just please stop. What are we trying to solve for? What do we notice that's happening in the room around us? What are you seeing that you haven't seen before simply because you took the time to stop? This can be analogous to the slow down to speed up mentality that we read about in business literature. And it really makes sense. It is about being intentional and purposeful, and it usually results in being more efficient and more effective as you do get moving later on. This is also a natural place to align with your, and I'm gonna say Jedi, AB uh, initiatives or plans. So here are all the things this means in North America. It could be justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, belonging, or any subgroup of those things. Um, and ultimately, what you're looking at is going to be determined by you and your stakeholders. Um, I really appreciate this, this graphic from Brooke King on Twitter that gives one perspective. She says, equality is everyone getting a book. Diversity is everyone getting a book or getting a different type of book. Equity is everyone getting a book that fits. Acceptance is understanding that we all read different kinds of books and belonging is reading the book you want without fear of judgment. So however you define DEI, I propose that DEI should not just be an initiative, it should be part of your core values. And luckily some really smart people at the Harvard Business Review agree. <laughs> They're, um, th I really appreciated this article, are your organization's DEI efforts superficial or structural? Because it, it, it is talking about doing something that matters, not something that's performative. Um, I think, especially in 2020, we saw lots of, uh, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, frankly, we saw lots of organizations, libraries, universities, corporations saying, this was an atrocity and we stand with people of color and here's our new diversity initiative. And they printed out a lovely sheet of paper and they posted it to their websites and then nothing really happened. I can tell you as a person of color in America, my experience of life in 2022 is not really different than in 2020. Uh, if I look in my rear view mirror and I see the police behind me, my heart stops beating for a second, even if I'm not doing anything wrong. To be fair, I have a lead foot and I do speed. So sometimes it's a, there is a, they probably should be behind me, but regardless, the, my experience of that and the physical, you know, thing that we, is not, is not great. So that hasn't changed in the last two slash 400 years. And so um, if you're going to do this work, it's really important that you do it in a structural and intentional way. And I also think that while individuals and organizations are doing this work at increased levels, it's also being addressed in systems work. So Kathy O'Neill recently hosted a webinar on the development of algorithms and the relationships to the problem of representation, bias, and diversity within applications. And while I could not find a recording of that webinar to share with you, I will share uh, that she is the CEO of O'Neill Risk Consulting and Algorithmic Auditing. 
their website here proclaim, which says it's the age of the algorithm and we have arrived unprepared, I thought was particularly important. And here's um, what they offer from their, on their website. Algorithms are increasingly assisting or replacing people in making important decisions. Today, algorithms help decide who gets hired, how much to charge for insurance, who gets approved for a mortgage or a credit card. They also inform choices about sentencing, parole, and bail. We tend to hear about these algorithms when they mess up and when they offer women less credit than men or make it harder for people with mental health stats to get jobs or treat black defendants more harshly than, right, than white ones. Whether made by people or algorithms, these are hard decisions. Sometimes they will be wrong, but there is no excuse for an algorithm to be racist, sexist, ageist, ableist, or otherwise discriminatory. I wanted to like cheer when I read that. So there is no excuse for our systems to be that way either. So whether you go hire uh, Kathy O'Neill to do a formal audit of your system, or whether you just look around the room and realize we have some work to do here, you really wanna know whose voices are missing. And a couple of things could happen when you do that, right? You might just look around the room and go, oh, well, we don't have any people from this particular group, a faculty group, a student group, uh, whatever it is, and then you just invite them. I mean, it can be as simple as that. You might look around the room and realize they're not there and there's nobody to invite. So that's a whole different kind of problem. And while you're thinking about this and trying to figure out how do we create a space where people are welcome and we invite them and they belong, think about what do we mean when we say belonging? Because defining that honestly depends on where you sit, right? Assimilation is not the same as belonging. There's another article, again, I linked a lot of things. There are a lot of good resources out there that suggests that to create a sense of belonging at your organization, start with these three simple and complex ideas. Number one, recognize, but don't overemphasize differences. I am a black woman. I look different than everybody in this room. I recognize that it's not a problem, but it's not the main reason that I'm here, right? It's just part of my identity. Create identity safe environments where people are unafraid to speak up when they see something that is not inclusive and focus your efforts more on the individual rather than only the group that they represent. If you've done all that and you still aren't hearing from a diverse group of colleagues, consider whether you've really created a safe space for people to speak up in the first place. And if you think that might actually be the heart of your problem, start here. Um, again, it, this is short, short articles, lots of nuggets, but it really, um, what I found in this article was, was that there really are some good tips for making sure that the space that you're creating is one where everyone feels comfortable speaking up. So once you've done this, so once you've taken some time to observe and assess, then we're going to move on to uh, the P in open, which is prepare. So I had to go there. Uh, journey is a great word to use when we're thinking about organizations and systems. And as you're looking at your organization and where you want to go, whether aligned with a strategic plan, your mission or vision, or what you individually want to work on, it helps to prepare for that journey. So I don't know if we have any other Trekkies in the room, but yay, okay. But I find uh, that the imagery and the stories from Star Trek tend to be universal. Even if you didn't watch it, you're totally missing out, but you understand it. It's pop culture, you've seen it, you know, we're, but you know what we're talking about. So, um, and incidentally, I will say, my ranking of the Star Trek series goes like this. <laughs> Star Trek, the next generation, absolutely the best Star Trek ever. Voyager comes in close second. Deep Space Nine is my third option. The original, because they're campy, are quite fun. Enterprise, frankly, I dismissed out of hand and have maybe watched four or five episodes, but I'm trying to like allow myself to be open and watch it now. It comes on at midnight in my time zone, so I should be sleeping, and when I can, I turn that on, and then often I have no problem falling asleep. Um, but I digress. Whether you are Captain Picard or Captain Janeway or Captain Pike, oh, because have we talked about the new services on streaming, or the new streaming, Picard, Discovery, Strange New Worlds, start Right, thank you. And then the animation ones. So start with Strange New Worlds if you haven't watched anything, it's very accessible. Um, but no matter who you are, no matter which captain you are, you're not gonna pull the darn starship out of the dock before it's fully loaded with all the supplies you need for intergalactic travel, right? We're talking about a long journey here. 
And I think the same is true as we aspire to live in an equitable and inclusive world. This is not a short, easy journey. If it was, we would have figured this out four centuries ago, and I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today. So as you look to update, upgrade, renovate, or completely reinvent your organizations, systems, or even yourself, you're going to need to make some preparations. This could be about people. Have you hired the right team? Does the team you hired have all the competencies you need to succeed? Or it could be about resources. Do you have the necessary infrastructure in place? Do you need new or improved software, hardware, or training on any of the above? Planning for success should look a little less like throwing spaghetti at a wall and seeing what sticks, and a little more like an organized event, even if it's loosely organized. A little structure matters, especially in planning or preparing. So this could be, again, as complicated as we need a new strategic plan for our organization, or it could be as simple as you writing your aspiration for the day on a sticky note, putting it on your monitor, and reminding yourself of what your intention for the day was. But what matters is that you've chosen a destination so you know where the heck you're headed. That way, if you get off your path, you know you're off the path. And so as we've looked around, determined our destination and made a plan and loaded our ship full of supplies, what next? What next is embark, jump in there and get to work, or as you know, Captain Picard would say, engage. So this is the fun part. It's also the scary part. It's where you think the real work happens, even though you've been doing this work for months before, or even potentially years before you got to this point. This is the point though, where it often becomes visible to others and where you finally get to test your theories. Try some things. It's as simple and as difficult as that. Test, iterate, see what happens, collect some data, evaluate it, do it again. As librarians and information scientists, you already do this every day in a myriad of ways. And as we endeavor to create more open systems, the basics really aren't any different. And if you're still not sure where to begin on this journey, I have two great resources for inspiration and some very practical steps. First, Cornell University's grad school, I heard an amazing speaker who then turned me onto this. They're, they have an entire website with more links than you could get through in hours and resources, but it is practical steps for supporting social justice and addressing inequities as a faculty member, dealing with working with students, working with other um, members of your campus community. There are so many resources on this page that if you do nothing else when you leave here, go to slide, whatever this is, I'm probably in the teens, click the link and learn some new things. Um, it really is a, a great starting place. They have strategic planning resources. There is, it's a very well curated list of things that can help you. Uh, the second re uh, resource I'd like to point you to, especially if you're in an academic library, is Grand Valley State University's work. Um, Annie Bellinger has been doing incredible work at Grand Valley State for a few years. Um, she, she, along with the Office of the Provost, came up with this diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging framework. They lay out their entire process from beginning to end. So you can see how they did the work they did. You can look at their uh, rubrics. You can read their white papers. It is all there. But if so, if you're not sure where to start, one of those two places might be a good place for you to start. All right. Before we move on to the most fun letter in the acronym. Um, last but not least. We have NAP. So I did not want to get involved in the age old librarian debate of cat versus dog. So I chose koala. Also, is there anything cuter than a napping koala? I'm not sure that there is. But for real, burnout is real. And we've already touched on that in this conference. And even before the pandemic, this article is from 2018. One in five employees is highly engaged and at risk of burnout. I, I frankly think that since we've experienced a global pandemic and are still frankly living in a global pandemic, I feel like that number is probably five out of five employees are at risk of burnout. I'm not sure anybody's highly engaged anymore because I don't know that we have the mental capacity to be that way. Um, this is, we're living in times that are unprecedented for us and as librarians, as faculty members, as leaders, again, I'm gonna call up the leaders in the room. How can you help your teams deal with this? 
by modeling and encouraging rest. I think our European colleagues do this much better than we do in the US, frankly, because your cultures tend to focus more on holistic living. You work to live, you don't live to work. Unfortunately, that memo failed to make it across the pond to the US. Uh, and I hope that our culture is not influencing you negatively, but it is really, it is a stretch to get people to not only accept that they don't have to work as much as they do, um, but to take their vacation time. I, Every year at every organization I've been at, I have had to say to my people, you you have a bank of vacation time. And if you don't use X number of hours by whatever the state is, you're going to lose that time. And every year people lose time. Can you imagine? I am not giving one vacation day to any employer ever. Take every stinking day, get away from work, take a break because your brain and your body needs it. And you come back to work a better person. So if you have not heard of, oh, yes, thank you, the NAP ministry. This fancy font might be hard to read, but what it says is, you are not a machine. Stop grinding. So if you haven't heard of Trisha Hersey and the NAP ministry uh, and the, the rest as resistance movement, now you have. Google it. Follow her on Instagram. Follow her on Twitter. It is, there are days that I literally will flip through be flipping through Instagram, I will see her post and I am like, yes, queen. And then that is it. I am done for the day because she really helps you understand that rest matters. And hopefully you recognize that your systems will not collapse with the absence of a single person for a day, a week, even a month. Um, and if they will collapse with the absence of one person for that period of time, you need to jump back to the observe stage and the prepare stage and ask yourself, why you don't have a succession plan. Because if somebody on your staff wins the lottery tomorrow and decides not to come back to work, what's your plan for making sure that those tasks, big and, big and small, continue to get done? Also in this stage where we might literally be napping, but if not literally, certainly taking a break, we are presented with an opportunity not only to rest, but to assess. What is working? What is not? What do you need more of? If these sound like appreciative inquiry questions, that's not uh, a mistake. They are. Remember that five uh, the, that five D process. Start there. See how far you've become, and then determine where you uh, you need to head next. What I really appreciate about the periods of rest, at least for me personally, is that's usually where inspiration strikes. So. I don't know about you, but I can be sitting at my desk wrestling with a challenge and feeling like I'm spinning my wheels. And frankly, when that happens, the best thing I can do is to simply get up, take a break and walk away and do something else. Um, my favorite brain break is to go out in my flower beds or my yard and pull weeds. I know you can like spray stuff on your yard to do it, but I find it so gratifying to literally just yank them from the root one at a time by hand and get my hands dirty. So and it's amazing what breathing that fresh air and just doing something mindless does for your headspace. Uh, I, it is the place often where I'm like, I don't know how to solve this thing. And then as I'm yanking weed, I go, oh, the idea pops into my head and suddenly I have a solution and I try to pull my phone out and write a memo so I don't forget it. And then I keep pulling weeds for a little bit. But whatever process works for you, find something that helps you get unstuck and practice it. I think there's also something to be said for creating workplaces where we nurture our teams in this way. Instead of modeling do more with less, which is an absolute fallacy, you cannot do more with less. It's BS. I promised myself I would not curse in this presentation, but it's BS. You should be encouraging, we should be encouraging our teams to do less with more, more intention, more passion, more resolve. We as humans, librarians, systems, we cannot do everything. And it might also be time to start politely saying no or asking what we can stop doing if we are asked to take on additional responsibilities or projects. Yes, I can do that thing. And what would you like me to not do anymore as I'm replacing my time with that? We are not Borg. And while we may be connected and interrelated, even the Borg had to stop to recharge, okay? So... I mean, come on, they plugged in every night. I, I, I will not apologize for the Star Trek references. I love my sci-fi. So as you do your work, build in time, build calendar time to stop, reflect, and maybe even nap. 
Um, my mother, who passed away almost two years ago, lived to be 97, and she often said the secret to her longevity was taking a nap every day. Who am I to argue with that wisdom? Um, on that note, I will say I hope something I've said today has been helpful to you as you continue your work and you look to be even more open and inclusive. Uh, or, sorry, be more open. I am over myself. Look to be more inclusive and engaged. Remember to also be open. And one last thing, um, there were a lot of resources that I found when I was preparing for this that didn't intuitively make sense anywhere in my presentation, but I thought they might be helpful or useful to you. So there's a slide at the end, those things all hyperlinked to articles you should be reading. Um, the, you know, the slowdown to speed up, proof that positive work cultures are more productive. The appreciative inquiry movement is not like toxic positivity, it's science-based information on how to be, on how being positive is actually a good thing. Um, signature traits of inclusive leadership and what inclusive leaders sound like. So there's a lot in here. If you wanna do a strategic plan to make sure that you're incorporating uh, the ideas of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, there's a link for you. Lots and lots of ways. And last but not least, frameworks to manage your energy reserves, because as I said, we are all burned out and it might be time to take a little rest. So that is the end of my prepared remarks, but I'm happy to take questions or comments at this time. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What do you want to know? Somebody's got to have a question. Huh? Yes. Thanks. So. Oh. I'm going to say, I'm Peter's saying yes, you should mic. Uh, thank you very much for that. It's uh, really important topics, especially given that open source and libraries are driven by culture and by people. I'm wondering, as you think about the differences between diversity and belonging, maybe in a library, but really in an open source community, what, what differentiates the two? Or how do you create that sense of belonging that really pulls people into a project and keeps them there? Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh. Yes and no. Okay, so I when I when you asked your question, the first thing I kind of thought of was um, catalogers and how they have been doing really great work in making sure that our cataloging terms are inclusive and and, and not just. So I'm thinking about the the documentary that came out of students at a school, and now I'm now my brain fog is is becoming real. Thank you. Yes, change the subject where students were looking up term, search terms in the library catalog and coming across terms like illegal immigrants and aliens and things that were frankly offensive and disrespectful. And so they did something about it with the help of you know, catalogers who really understood the problem. So I wonder if in open source, if we can have some, kind of that similar thing, are we, is the language that we're using unintentionally being a deterrent to those in, the, in our community? Um, if we don't have people, a diverse representation in the groups that we're working with, is it because they're not in libraries or they're just not, we just don't know them? How do we find them? How do we track them? And I think we struggle with this, I think even as the OLF board, how do we market what we do and get more people to volunteer knowing that they're gonna get a lot of uh, hopefully experience and good experience out of that, but it's attracting those candidates is hard. Um, I think if you are, if you're new to this, there are some spaces I would encourage you to get into. Uh, we Here is a, a group of librarians, archivists, museum employees that are, um, it's, it's not a support group. It's like a professional association, although loosely, if, you know, organized for people who are from that, from BIPOC backgrounds. And that might be a place for you to engage and advertise a, a job or advertise an opportunity if you're trying to reach a more diverse audience, for example. Um, but I, yeah, I, I don't know if that's helpful at all, but that's, that's kind of where I would go. Yeah. And, and diversity, I mean, diversity is really just something you can see, right? It's not like the end thing, the belonging is making people feel comfortable. And unfortunately, what I've learned is that some people are going to have to experience some discomfort in order for everybody to feel comfortable. So just be willing to be uncomfortable for a minute. It's, 
I mean, it's uncomfortable on both sides. And there are, if you create that safe space for conversations, then you can ask hard questions or even just questions that aren't hard, but that you didn't, you didn't know how to respond to. I've, I've had that happen because we've had these conversations, for example, at OhioNet, people are willing to ask questions that are even not even work related, but they're more about like, Nancy, tell me about your experience as a black person navigating this world. And how does that affect the work that we do here? So if you create those spaces for those conversations, I think you'll also create a more open environment and people will hear about it and they'll say, hey, I want to be involved in that. Yeah, go, go. Oh, sorry, I'll wait for the mic. Hi, so I was wondering, so one thing, you know, we might not be a very racially diverse, you know, group, but like we've talked about, we are a very international group. And so one thing that I always wonder is how we avoid like, imposing imposing American anxieties and categories like racial categories on cultures when we're interacting in an international group and whether we're actually erasing their perspective. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I, I mean, I have thoughts, but I'm not sure they're worth it. So yes, it is a hard, even coming to this today, my, my intent was not to be North American centric, but that is what I am. So it's, you know, it's hard to like not be who I am and recognize that you guys all have different experiences, hence my, your experience may vary. But I think the fact that you're even asking the question or that we're thinking about it is a step in the right direction because it means that we recognize we don't live in a vacuum, that we, we are living on a globe full of other people that don't have our experience. And so I think we just need to be careful with our language. Um, and say things like that at the beginning, you know, I don't intend to be disrespectful. So if there's something I need to know about your culture or your background that will help me be more respectful, do that. But I think a lot of it, frankly, can be solved with words if we choose them carefully and use them well. Uh, to follow up on that, I ha have a colleague who is from Chile. He lives in uh, uh, the bottom near the penguins, he always says. And he corrected me when I, I'm always saying I'm American. I'm an American. Well, so is he an American. Absolutely. And just that now I have to think before I say American and, and it really does kind of open your mind to, to some, what is language. I think that that is a good point. Thank you. Oh, over on your left or my left. Sorry. You're right. Hi, I'm Owen Stevens. I, I wanted to uh, pick up on your points about burnout and, and what you say yes and no to. Mm -hmm. In this project, we're, uh, we ask people to give, I think, a lot of time, uh, and that's the most valuable commodity we can get from them. And we still have challenges, especially we've talked uh, this week about uh, and previously about the difficulty of finding people to take particular roles in the project, which are, of course, often being asked to do above and beyond whatever roles they already play in their organizations. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, um, we obviously don't want to be contributing to that burnout. Uh, and yet at the same time, we, we want to progress the project and we want to find ways of bringing people in. Do you have any uh, kind of comments on how, what we can do in terms of supporting people to avoid that and perhaps also what we can do in terms of helping organizations free up time so people can contribute to projects like this which they have a, a stake in but but it's difficult for them to commit to yeah i i think um from a lib from a library perspective i think i said this at the beginning i think we do a lot of things that we don't need to do anymore. And we do them because we've always done them. We've always done this thing this way. And so we have a 17 step process or something that could be completed in three steps because God damn it, we're librarians and we're going to do it the most complicated way that we can. I don't, I don't know if that's a North American thing or just a librarian thing, but so, okay. So that's, that's a global thing. All right. So honestly, it's, it's the slow down to speed up. We, so let's look at all of the things that we are doing and figure out what things, if we didn't do that, what impact would it actually have? Would the world fall apart or would we adapt and find a new way to move on, right? Um, I think especially not just with Folio and, and other open source projects, but if you're at an institution that's interested in this and your institution is vested in it, then hopefully your leadership is saying, I don't want you to do your full-time 40 hour week job and volunteer 10 or 20 hours a week. This is so important to the organization that we're gonna take away 
10% of what you're doing or 20%. So you have time to do that during your regular work hour. And if your leadership is not committed that way, then I would have to ask why, because you're looking for this great solution that enables you to avoid commercial solutions that we're all unhappy with. So you have to be willing to invest something. As someone said on Monday, probably more than one person, or Monday, Wednesday, open source isn't free. It comes at a cost. So what are you willing to give up? So I think it's, and I know none of this is easy, but if we really want to get the work done and not have people burned out, we're going to have to stop doing some things on a small scale and on a large scale, but also imagine what we're going to discover when we stop doing those things. I mean, it might be like a revelation and then you're like, oh, God. don't think about the amount of time you've spent doing it over in the past. Just think about the time that you will have saved in the future. <laughs> so it's, and, mo and frankly, modeling the rest thing to me is, is the thing as well. Like I, I am guilty of being on maybe too many committees and doing too many things. So I practice what I preach and I take time off and I tell my people to take time off. And I mean it, do not check your email when you're on vacation. It is just not good for your brain or, and you're not going to give hundred percent to your job either. So hopefully something in there, I encourage and figure out how we can stop doing so many things to start focusing on the things and prioritizing. The other thing I would say is timelines. I know personally, I'm super ambitious. So if I find a new project or a new thing I want to do or whatever, I'm like, I'm going to get this done in the next three months, six months, whatever whatever you think your timeline is going to be like double or triple that and then give yourself some grace because whether it's, you know, knitting a sweater or creating a new system, it's probably going to take two or three times longer than you thought. And that's okay. As long as you get to where you're going in the first place. So let's be realistic, more realistic about timeframes would be the other piece of advice, I suppose. Did Peter know he was going to get a workout today or? I'm just gonna, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, over the last few years and, and, and a lot longer, um, there's been a lot of talk about sort of structural problems, right? And this group is creating a structure. Um, and so, you know, this group, and, and, and you mentioned before, um, sort of starting from scratch, leaving the past behind. And so we're, as we're creating these structures, and you're highlighting maybe some areas in which, you know, who's not in the room here, um, we're probably not seeing some of the problems with the structures that we're creating. And I'm th thinking there should be some, you know, we, I was in a session about uh, technical debt, um, where the, the cost of fixing simple, you know, taking the shortcut now has costs later. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there needs to be some kind of concept of debt related to building structures um, and, not addressing issues that become much harder to, to rectify if the right people weren't involved, excuse me, weren't involved um, to begin with. So I don't have a question. Yeah. Um, it's just sort of a thought about, um, about what we're doing here and how we're doing it. Yeah, I, when I was um, still a library director, we call that deferred maintenance when it was the building, right? Deferred maintenance is a lie. If you push off the maintenance that needs to happen in your 200 year old building and you keep pushing up, eventually that catches up with you. So how do you think about it at the beginning so that you're not just saying, oh, it's raining in the library. It'll stop raining tomorrow. True story. It rained inside my library. It was very bad. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And that was because we ignored structural problems for forever. So yeah, I appreciate your comment. We do need to find ways to embed in our system checkpoints or something so that we're, you know, thinking about those things before it's too late or before it creates more work. Okay, seeing no more hands or sort of hands, I'll turn it back over to Beth, but thank you again.